All right. Praise the Lord. We had a wonderful time in Prairie down in Petersburg, Virginia. Two and a half hour drive south. Like 30 minutes, not even 30 minutes south of Richmond. But um, about that winter wonderland in the morning. Boy, that was so pretty. And it was that sticky snow, so it was all over the trees. So it just really looked like a winter wonderland. Uh, it was very pretty. Didn't bother us. We were able to easily get down there and back. It was warmer down there. That's kind of part of the reason why I asked Bishop to uh, <coughs> do it down there around this time of the year. I figure if it snows here, at least we can go down there and do something. <laughs> I got a four wheel. I'll make it. <laughs> Amen. So we can at least have prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, no. Clear. Yeah, maybe a little rain, but it was clear. Now, that's why I went down south, man. It's great. Now, and, uh, next next month, we'll be in D.C. with uh, Esther Terry Mullen. They're in uh, southeast. Hallelujah. It's the gateway. That said, let's open up word of prayer. Father, thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your presence and your spirit. And Lord, we know that you're going to teach us, Holy Spirit, you are inside us to teach us. And we have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, uh, of course, the next time I know that I'll be back there, we'll have a Day of All Nations, which we all are invited, June 1st. It's kind of an all-day affair. And um, uh, that's a Saturday. And um, food's provided. And uh, we'll have, I'll be the white pastor <laughs> that shares on that day. While the other pastors are different countries, you know, amen. It's all about bringing all the nations together in Christ. Amen. Because that's what we need to be, the body of Christ. Which is the vision of Partners for Transformation Act. Let's bring the body together because in unity we do support. Amen? We'll get some things done. It's in unity that God poured out a spirit. Right? So it's in unity that he's going to do the same thing. Amen. I've been looking into revival. Paul's in that. God still rescues people today. Amen? Yeah. That's the bottom line. And prayer is, well, is key to that. You never know when you're praying that you could be praying for somebody else to be rescued. To be delivered. That's why it's so important to pray in the Holy Spirit. Because God can use you to do all kinds of things in the Spirit. And I just I, I get excited. I don't I don't feel bad if I pray a long time in the Holy Spirit without even saying anything in English. Because man, I believe God's just getting things done. You hook up, amen. You hook up. God's getting things done, things that I that need to be done. Uh, I truly believe that. It's not praying on the spirit. It, it's what's needed to be prayed about that's on the mind of the Holy Spirit that we need to pray about. Sometimes he shares in understanding, and other times he doesn't. But I believe he's getting things done through our prayers. And we'll have prayer tonight as well. But God still rescues people today, as he did in Bible times. His mercies are still new every morning today as it was when David wrote that. Okay, his mercies are new. And when King Darius was tricked into throwing Daniel into the lion's den, remember God rescued Daniel out of the lion's mouth, right? They, they didn't bite him. They didn't eat. Now the folks that got thrown in after him, they devoured him up before he even hit the ground. That's what it says. They were devoured. Their bodies and their families were devoured before they even hit the ground. You know, the lions were still hungry just because they can't, they couldn't bite them or eat him. They were still hungry. So when those families were thrown in, they they had a meal. And King Darius exclaimed about Daniel's God, and we'll read out of the. Daniel 6.27, as a contemporary English uh, version, it says, He rescues people 
and sets them free. By working great miracles, Daniel's God has rescued him from the power of the lions. Amen. Yeah. And, that's, and that is exactly the truth. God is still doing that today. Uh, don't think he isn't. Don't sell God short. Amen? Don't sell God short. He still rescues and he uses miracles, signs, wonders. And I, I get excited about those things as you do, as we should do. The Bible says desire spiritual things like that. But there is a better way, and that is love. And love works. And, and what does love engine or motors? It motors faith. And faith will get things done all the time. Miracles come as the Spirit of the Lord wills, however he measures it, how people believe. There's so many little factors into why a miracle can happen. But one thing that you can factor will always end in victory, and that is you walking by faith. Okay? Yeah, God will do miracles and rescue you. Absolutely. And, and you know, like I said, there are factors that are involved there. I don't know at all. I just trust God and know he wants to do good. That's all I know. So I just believe whenever. <laughs> Amen. Whenever the spirits are moving that way. Hallelujah. But one thing that you can always factor in as ending in victory is your walk in faith. That will always end in victory. And so you see that's why God would emphasize learning to walk by faith. I mean, yes, will miracles happen because of our faith? Absolutely. God will work miracles. But you knew he was going to make you have a victory. Amen. You knew you were going to get the victory. You don't really care about how you get to the other side. You just got to know you're getting there. Amen. So that's, that's, that's how we want to look at this. Because I believe God will always do, rescue those who fear him, put him first, you know. And we'll need God's help and rescue today. There are there's things that we don't know. None of us seem to walk this perfectly. But we do have a perfect Savior. And he loves us unconditionally. And if we have constant faith in that love, we'll have victory. He will rescue us. He'll deliver us. And we'll know it's his deliverance. We'll believe and receive. And, well, and, and you know, and we'll walk with the Lord. And if he doesn't rescue, like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he, they still won't bow to the devil and his winds. So, you know, I still won't. Whether God does something or does it doesn't change my position, my love for him, and trust in him. That'll save your life if you'll learn to be that way. Don't put conditions on God. Okay? But there is that certain way of deliverance. That's walking by faith. Living life according in accordance to his word. Think about it. We live, walk, talk, operate in faith our whole lives long. For example, when you came into church today, did you inspect the building before you walked through the door? Huh? Did you, anyone do that? Uh, or, or did you hire an engineer to see if the chair that you're sitting in right now was able to support a human body before sitting down in it? Did you do that? No, you just walked through the door and sat down. That's faith. Why? Because you believe. You believe. You believe that that chair is going to sustain your body this whole service long. Amen. In fact, you'd be shocked if it broke. You'd be shocked if the building crumbled and you walked in. That would shock you. You see, that's faith. It's not looking at the natural. You just know that it'll work. But do you really know that that chair is going to hold you when you sat down in it? I mean, no, not really. I mean, you have to inspect it and everything else and uh, get the A-OK -okay from a professional. You don't really know, but see, you have faith because. Now, of course, it's more routine because you've been coming in here for years, sitting down probably in the same chair. 
or close to it. it smells like your perfume and clone. All right. And you, you know it's going to work, right? You're still here sitting and no one fell out of their chair. So there you go. That's faith. We do it all the time. Because we know God. We believe. We know his word. We believe. His word says that that's final, man. That's, that's the end of the story. He said it. So let's focus our faith by having faith in God always, always in his word. We talked last week about the centurion soldiers, great faith. Now let's look at another Gentile who had great faith too. And we'll be uh, in Matthew 15. Twenty-first verse. It reads, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, uh, or Sidon, and behold, a woman uh, uh, of Canaan, or actually they say Canaan is how you say that, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she also came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And he said, and she said, I'm sorry, she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So you don't want to feed your dogs under the table. <laughs> anyway, okay. Now I want to point out some things here. That both these people of great faith, okay, were not Jews. They weren't God's covenant people. They were Gentiles. They had no covenant with God. And she knew that. Now, this is important to note. Why is it important to note? Because one of the reasons that people who know that they have no stance with God can possibly have any hope of salvation through his word, and truly nothing else is really needed to have great faith. And what I'm saying here is because you know you have no stance with God. That if there's going to be anything of this or from this, it's going to be because God's word, because of God's character, because of who he is, how he is understood. You know, God was understood to be merciful, or she started out saying that right off the bat. Oh, have mercy on me, right? She knew God was merciful. So she had this understanding, and she obviously been around some teachers and probably talked, listened to some people talk in the shop or in, maybe heard some rabbis chatting on the corner or something about God, and she heard some things, and then she heard about Jesus, this rabbi who's going around, miracles are happening, and she knew he obviously had the power to do something and, and because he'd been doing it, and, uh, you know, and she knew she had no stance. Uh, it's kind of similar to another story in the Bible where you have a you have a Pharisee and a tax collector coming in to before God and the Pharisee praying to himself. When he's praying to God, he's praying to himself, thinking how great he is and giving himself all these credentials as to why he's so good. And then the other guy smoking his chest, 
Oh God, not worthy, but have mercy. Kind of the same attitude. She's not worthy. She's a Gentile. She doesn't even have a covenant with God. But God is so good. Amen. Maybe she did hear about the centurion soldier's servant. Maybe she heard of wind, got wind of that. I don't know. But she comes to him. Verse 22. It reads, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So, so she knew that he was Lord, that he was the son of David, that God is merciful, and that her daughter who was demon-possessed needed to be delivered. And he delivered people. She knew all, that's all she had to go on. <clears throat> she was going on the very nature that she was not privy to from God. She was going on the very nature of those in the covenant of God know or should know and walk in. She was going with nothing of her own at all. See, great faith, the beginning of great faith, in addition to fear of God, but in the beginning of great faith, start because you come to the end of yourself. It starts on the knowledge that God is the one who's merciful, that God is good, that God has authority that can be exercised in this earth over an enemy, the devil. That you or I have nothing in our own natural position to stand on, only that God said something, and because he said it, we can act on it. Because he said it, we can act on it. God is merciful. We can act on that mercy. In fact, when you ask and act on the mercy of God before you were born again and, had, and were entered into the new covenant, you had no stance with God yourself. You had no stance with God. None of us. We were all sinners. None of us had any stance with God. We had no reason to believe in and of ourselves, our possessions, who we're with, who we're related to, nothing. The great faith begins when you come to the end of yourself. And so, because what? We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. So that's how you're saved. So she had that. So she had all the makings for being able to get the answer here. And what's even more interesting about this story is the next verse, even though, okay, she's coming with no stance at all, only saying what she knows is true about Messiah, about the God of the Jews being merciful. See, and, and she says this to Jesus, and he doesn't even answer her. Doesn't say a word. Nothing to her. Not one thing. That to me is very interesting. Has you ever spoke and asked God and didn't think you got a word from him on anything? But people of great faith 
Because what she said about Jesus is absolutely true, isn't it? She said, what she said about Jesus is absolutely true. He is the son of David, that he is merciful. Amen. That salvation is of the Jews, and that he's Lord over Satan and demons and the things that have fallen into the nature of this world. He's the Lord over it. She knew all that. She was absolutely right, and he answered her not a word. But did she give up? No. Jesus didn't answer a word and let that truth stand. And sometimes when God doesn't answer a word, he's needing you to let that truth stand and be built up in your heart. See, you got to build that word up in your heart. And him not answering is the wisest thing. Because until you build faith in your heart, in other words, by that, by building faith, you have all the faith you need. I mean, you're born again. If you're born again, you have all the faith you need. But do you have the endurance? Do you have the will, the, 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 the with all inside you, that, that this truth about God stands alone apart from anything I could or would do. It's his truth alone that life is sustained, isn't it? Life is sustained because God says so. And so we got to let that build in us. So if God hasn't answered you, you got to, that means build time. That means build myself up in faith so that I have great faith. I have enduring faith. I am ready to walk in believing with God. And the fact that I have to walk means it's not instant. I'm ready to take this walk with God because that truth alone stands, not anything uh, credited to me as far as anything I earned, anything that I did. I just let that truth stand in me as the answer. You see, this is where a lot of people who teach faith fail. They don't let the word stand in them alone. No, they're looking at signs and wonders and this happens and that happens and, ooh, I got goosebumps. They're looking for all these natural things. You who walk in great faith, walk in great faith because you let the word of God stand alone. What's Jesus to say? It's true. Everything she said was absolutely true. It's who he was, what was going on, what was the time, everything. Now, verse 24. And of course, what happened? Okay? Not verse 24, I'm still in verse 23. Uh, what happened here? Okay? What happened here? And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Okay. This verse 23 is a power packed faith character trait that you need to have in it. First of all, Jesus let the word stand alone. Okay. Now, when you let the word stand alone, then and that's what you have no reason to believe that anything good was going to work out, that any answer to the end of this situation was going to happen. You have nothing else to believe because you of yourself obviously have no way to make it happen or you would have. Okay? You let that word stand alone. And, uh, and if there are others around you who see you saying the word of God, they hear you say it, and then they come at you or about you. Where is your God that you say is merciful, has power over demons? 
Where is he? I don't hear him. I mean, Jesus wasn't even talking to us. You see the kind of building that's got to be built in there? What are you going to do when opposition rises up and says and contradicts that word that stands alone? I'll tell you what most people do. They start questioning. They start wondering, is this really the way God leads? Does he really need that? You see, people of great faith trust the word. And even if God himself doesn't say anything more, not a word more, that's good enough. It's the truth. Amen. You're going to have people that will come against you, tell you that, oh, quit this Christian stuff. Are you ready to come, come hang out with the rest of us? We'll all go to the bar and we'll drink and moan and bemoan everything about our lives together. You see, the Word of God has got to stand alone. And even, I mean, just think about it. The devil just added more to it with having these people say things. And you know, not not Jesus not answering, having his disciples say, send her away, that could have easily you know, detracted her from pursuing. She could have just, oh, I guess, I guess the Lord doesn't want to kill my daughter. I guess the Lord doesn't want to do it. Look, he's not answering me. These people over here are saying this. I guess it mustn't be God's will. Not to a person of great faith. They let that word stand alone. They let that truth stand alone. As true. You know, and I honestly think this is a test. You know, God does test you, right? You ever felt tested of the Lord? Sometimes people mistake Satan's testing you for being the Lord's testing. But I'm telling you right now, God does test you. Maybe the first time you ask him or start talking to him about something, you don't hear anything. But you know something about him, or you wouldn't even come to him. And uh, when, when, now in this case, this lady didn't have time for that. But in, in your case, when you ask the Lord and you, you don't seem to get anything going on the inside, then get into the Word. And continue to build that truth so that it does stand alone in you. Sometimes God is testing you to find out, are you going to really believe the word? Do you believe the word? He does not always answer right away. Because if he's already said it in his word, you've got his answer. But you're still yet not convinced of it. You see, Abraham, he was persuaded that he which had promised was able to do it. Amen? So people of great faith let the word stand. And if you're, if you're struggling there, if you're oscillating or something like that, God, get into the word. Maybe God's testing you. Do you really believe enough to hang in there? The great faith isn't about the amount of faith. It's about the endurance of faith. It's the queen of all characteristics. Endurance that just keeps going and going and going, that is a characteristic that is queen in your life. You don't give up. People of great faith never give up because they let the word stand alone. And they'll build themselves up in, in that word, as she did. And so, I mean, in the short time that she had there, she was really building it up in the Lord. I'm amazed. I mean, it's still an amazing story today. 
Because, see, you've got to resolve in your heart to believe in the unchanging truths of God. you got to, you got to have that resolved in your heart. That is it, man. This is it. One, in this case, God was merciful. And that Jesus was the Messiah. She could tell that he was the Messiah. And we know that his mercies are new every day and they're everlasting. He's always merciful. These are character traits of God that don't change. Why would they? Why would why would God's mercy change? It wouldn't. But you're going to have to know God's word. Take time to study it for yourself. Actually be interested in the Bible. Actually be interested in knowing the content of the 66 books. Learn it. Know it. Believe what God has already said and revealed first and foremost in your Bible, because that's where the Holy Ghost on the inside of you is going to confirm. He's going to confirm what the Word says. Anything in the Bible is true. And he inspired the Bible, so he's not going to say anything contrary to it. Now, he may say something contrary to your understanding of the Bible, but it doesn't mean he's contradicting his words. See, some, for whatever reason, if, if we think our own thoughts are always right. No, your thoughts aren't always right about God. There are many areas in your life, probably, that you need to have some tweaking here and there. I can say that for my own self. And since I'm a human and you're a human, more than likely you, you probably have the same sense. Uh, and, you know, a good example of this revelatory approach is, you know, one time Jesus had, did an open vision with Dad Hagen, and he was talking to him. And um, in the middle of Dad Hagen and Jesus, this demon jumps up and down and goes, yak, 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 doing all this, and 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 and, and, uh, and he couldn't hear what Jesus was saying. This this is what happened to him. He couldn't hear what Jesus, this demon was so noisy. Folks, our phones, man, our devices, so noisy that he couldn't hear what Jesus was saying, even though Jesus was talking. You notice in this story, this really happened. Jesus kept talking, and the demon kept throwing up smoke and making all kinds of noise, over shouting over Jesus. Jesus didn't bother raising his voice. He just kept saying the same thing, whatever he was saying. He just kept talking. So eventually, but hey, he got tired of it, See, that's the thing. I mean, until you get tired of the devil messing around with your life, you may not do anything. Again, that's a test. He said, in the name of Jesus, be quiet. And immediately, boom, the demon fell down to the ground and whimpered like a whipped pup. Okay? Boom, right there. And Surprised, but Brother Hagen's like, oh, Jesus, you were talking and I didn't hear it, but I'm just kind of some, some, you know, just summary of it. Uh, you know, I, you didn't hear. I mean, I couldn't hear what you were saying. Why did, why didn't you stop that demon from talking and making all that noise? Jesus said, I couldn't. And he looked at him and said, What? You, you mean you wouldn't, right? Right? You said you, you said I, I misheard you, right? You you wouldn't, right? No, I said I couldn't. No, no. I mean, just let me just hear you. I'm, I'm, I think I'm just hearing you. You said you wouldn't, right? I think you did it another time. No, I couldn't. And then Jesus began to teach him about authority. If you don't take authority over the devil, Jesus can't. Listen 
to these truths. Nowhere in the scripture does it say Jesus can do this. Everywhere in the New Testament says Jesus has done this. He's already defeated the devil. So he can't do what you need to do. He can't stop the devil. You have to stop the devil with the authority in Christ, with his name. And if you don't do it, he ain't doing it because he can't do it. He gave that authority, that responsibility over to you, and you've got to act on it. And if you don't, he won't because he can't. He gave that authority over to you. You know, God doesn't take back his gift. You understand this authority over the enemy is a gift from God, and he does not repent from that. He's glad to give you his authority in the name of his son. He's glad to give you the name of Jesus as your inheritance. And he expects you to put on your big boy pants, okay, and act like a child of the king. And he is not going to take that responsibility from you. You're going to have to exercise that authority over the enemy. And the scriptures confirm that. He said, you go into all the world preach the gospel. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You cast out demons in my name. He ain't retracting from that command. That is something you and I have to do. And if we're ever going to grow up, He has to keep his hand off of it. He has to allow you the ability to exercise. What world can you be someone seated by Father God and not know how to operate in authority? How can you do that? You can't. You, God expects you to grow up, take up the word, the charge, the name of Jesus, and use it effectively in this earth today because he can't do it. He won't do it. He can't do it. He gave that over to you. So, you know, and we as parents, we got to do that with our own children. You know, there's a time you just got to let them do. Now, you pray for them, help where you can, but you let them deal with themselves because you have to. We have to grow up from it. We have to act like adults in the room, okay? We have to. We've got to take our responsibility and make it happen as the Spirit guides you. And know that God is for you, not against you. Amen. It's like we opened up. If God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. The God's for you. Everybody say God's for me. Well, you can do this. You will. You must do this. If you're going to do it. You must. Don't act like kings, kid. Amen? But then also, let's go to okay, you know, Jesus answered. We read it. He answered her. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now, now, now not only is Jesus had, didn't answer until the disciples piped in and, and, and kind of put, stirred the pot a little bit there, a little. And uh, then he says, well, I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, so now now she might feel, okay, this is why you didn't answer me, because he ain't sent to me. She could have said, oh, okay. You're not sent to, to me. And this sounds cut and dry, doesn't it? Right? This is cut and dry. 
He wasn't sent to the Gentiles as of yet. He was later, but and the Bible says he was going to be. So we know it was going to happen. But at that time, he was sent, and that was his mission, to go preach the gospel, tell them that salvation has come to the Jews, the covenant people of God, the people who had this covenant and who had, you know, did all these ceremonies and things and learned the, the Ten Commandments and all these things, that, you know, realizing that their position was feeble before God. They had no ground to stand. They all knew that. Uh, but then many of them were just working and working and doing the work, which, you know, in the Old Covenant, was it was sort of work. It is still work today, but it's different. Now, but um, this sounds like a hard-clad answer, doesn't it? This sounds like this, this is it, man. Have you ever had, sometimes when we approach God with a certain way of thinking, we find something else in the Bible that just kind of almost feels like it sets up a wall that you can't go forward. You see this with a lot of women preachers, you know. They can't go forward because there's some hard-clad, at least apparent hard-clad scriptures that say women can't preach in the pulpit. Okay? But they're not hard-clad. Do a little study, you find out that it's not so hard. In fact, the Bible says, neither male nor female, but new creation. And in fact, Paul wrote in part of it that no such traditions are in the church. So, you know, the anointing of God works on anyone and through anyone who's willing to yield. And see, that's, that's the thing with God. But, you know, that's just one example. The, the, but in this case, this was seems like a wall right here. Seems like the Lord, the God, here, made flesh, was throwing up a wall. He really wasn't, but he, he was making straight some, you know, he had a, you know, he had an end game to this. Okay? Um, he did. He had an end game to this. But we'll see it. Verse 25, and then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Okay? Jesus has set up an impossible barrier to this woman as far as it reads, as I can read it, it just surface-wise. You know, when I first read that scripture for the first time in my life, I was like, oh, my gosh, how rude, Jesus, really? I don't know if you read that same reaction I had. But, I mean, just surface reading, that is exactly what I thought. Like, oh, my goodness. Okay? But I thought what was interesting is that no matter what the wall seemed to be, she still kept with the initial truth that Jesus is the son of David, that he's merciful, and that he can deal with the devil. Because at that time, he had the authority. He didn't give it to the body of Christ yet. He had it. And no devil argued with them. Okay? They begged him to do different things, but they all had to go when he said to. Right? And so, um, you know, now we have that same authority. But she worships him and she says, Lord, help me. Okay, your word is true. I still need help. Help me because I know you're merciful. What kept her saying and pursuing Jesus. She knew he was merciful and he could deal with these demons. She knew it. Even though he put all these walls up, seemingly. But to me, these were, like, these, were, these were actually pointed steps to really emphasize how faith and the pursuit of walking in faith we have got to do 
She came to the absolute end of herself. Okay, that's the truth, Lord. You're sent to the, the, the you know, the Jews. You weren't sent to this, this person here, this Gentile woman. You weren't sent to me. Help me. Help me. Lord, help me. See, she came to the end of herself. Everything, you might be in, in bad situations, and, and you might say, oh, Lord, help me. Amen? God will help you. He is a rescuer. That's his nature. And when you come to the end of yourself, and God, because of his, what his word says about him, you come to that conclusion, then you see the power of God released in your life. And notice she didn't blame God. She worshiped God. God. We were, we've been reading Job. He didn't blame God. He didn't understand. He was trying to understand. He thought that maybe God is responsible for it. And he didn't know. But he, he, but he was working with the best knowledge he had, Job. And um, in the end, he was blessed and restored. And, he, and then we know from the book of Job what exactly happened. The devil incited Job against God. You see, when things happen in your life, you understand that the enemy is trying to incite you against God. But notice she didn't blame God. No, nope, no, nope. she just kept worshiping God. She worshiped him and said, Lord, help me. People with great faith stay in faith because they worship God through enduring and in the test and trial without blaming or accusing God. Job's example of that. And he, he lifted up God's greatness and everything. Now, in prayer yesterday, the Lord gave me two, two quotes. and I don't know, I like to decorate them or something and make them out there because I think these are really good quotes. Two things. And one of the things he says, if people could see the death caused by blaming others, then they wouldn't blame another again. If people could see the death caused by blaming others, then they wouldn't blame another again. I can expound on that, but in, in, in short, um, blaming other people, even God or yourself, for that matter, gets you nowhere. It only shows death. Anytime you blame, you're only showing death. Blaming this person or that person, blaming the government, blaming your neighbor, blaming your dog, blaming whatever. It gets you nowhere. It only sows death. The blame game only sows death. And it, it doesn't address the issue. It doesn't fix the scenario. So let's stop the blaming, because it's going to cause death. Anytime you blame someone, you're causing death. And the biggest death is your own attitude. Because if you're blaming somebody, then you'll end up in walking in unforgiveness towards that person. You won't forgive them. Oh, I forgive them, but it's their fault. Don't even entertain those kinds of words. So what if it is their fault? Is God not bigger than their fault? So why even bother to blame? God's bigger. That's what you're supposed to say. Well, you know, God's bigger than you. Now, I know. Us, us married people, we can be like that. People I work with can blame the company for this and blame the company for that. Right? <laughs> it's natural humans. But, yes. That was the first thing he said. If people could see the death caused by blaming others, then they wouldn't blame another again. The other thing he said to me, 
God's love never fails, so don't fail to walk in it. God's love never fails, so don't fail to walk in it. Boy, I want those two quotes dressed up somewhere. Put it out there. So that so the AI co-pilot of Microsoft says, Oh, John Wink said on February 17, 2024, these two quotes. <laughs> Amen. Because I, I looked them up too. I, I, yeah, I don't know if you did that. I did that. I looked up. I said, Has anyone ever said this? And it gave me some wonderful things on blaming. You ought to write that. That's really amazing. Some, some of the things that people have said about blaming and not blaming. Good quotes, good stuff. But not that exact wording that I just gave you. Now, same thing with the loved one. A lot of good things out there on it. So she sought the Lord's help and mercy. Great faith knows the Lord is able and will do. It sticks to the word. You notice she initiated the word of God in this situation, didn't she? Jesus didn't come knocking on her door saying, oh, woman, do you need a deliverance for your daughter? She came after to Jesus knowing that he had these things and knowing these things about him, and he had these things. It's very similar to um, the unjust judge. Remember the story? The unjust judge didn't care. It's in Luke 18. The unjust judge didn't care about any man, didn't regard God, didn't care about anything like that. And then uh, this woman had a complaint, and she said, give me justice. And he didn't act on it right away. And so she kept coming back. Look, this is true. This is not just that you ignore this. This is not just. You need to give me justice here. She kept at it, and he said, though I don't fear man or God, but because this woman's bugging me. Okay, she keeps coming at me. I'm going to make sure she gets justice. And, and, and Jesus says, did you hear the unjust judge? I mean, the judge had all kinds of authority. And he could have met justice, but he wasn't. But because she kept pursuing it, wore him down. He gave her up and, and made sure this woman got, got taken care of. But he didn't want to keep her knocking at his door anymore. And then Jesus said, okay, look, if people can be broken down like that, just by, by harassing and haranguing. Now, in this case, she was right. The law was being broken, and it was unjust, and she was getting the back backhand of that injustice. She didn't like it, but she's doing something about it. No, you don't take the backhand of injustice and not do something about it. And... He said, God who loves you made a covenant with you. I'm, I'm kind of adding to it, but it's not wrong to do this because this is the thoughts behind it. Um, how much more will God speedily deliver his own children? Let's see. we, we got to see God that way, that he will deliver his children. And as we stick in his word and we believe his word and will not be moved from it, we'll get the deliverance, we'll walk in the victory, amen. We'll have what our faith, the end of our faith. Verse 27, and he said, and she said, again, it's like Jesus was saying all these things, you know, uh, she said, Lord, help me. And then he goes, but he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Okay? If you're not in covenant with God. This is this blessing. Is, this is 
type of association. The reason I'm here is because of these people, not because of your people. These people have a covenant with God, and i got to see to it that God's people get the covenant treatment. Think about it. Think about it. And we're New Covenant Christians sitting there wallowing in our sorrows, wallowing in our pains and our sicknesses, wallowing in our poverty. And <clears throat> Jesus was sent to us. He did something about it. He did something about it. And she would not give up. And it's like, and again, this, this, this statement that Jesus made just seems like a closed-end statement that, that <clears throat> could walk away and say, you know what, I guess it's just not God's will for me to be healed or my daughter to be healed. I guess it's just not. I don't meet the qualifications. I don't meet the, I'm not the right type. But no, 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 people of great faith know God's character from the beginning and stick with it. Amen? Because God doesn't change. And she said, yes, Lord. Again, she agreed with God. She agreed with the word. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that which fall from the master's table. So she said, yeah, you guys are the ones. But you know what? Look, I have dogs, and stuff falls off the table, and they get it. So, yeah, I get it. I'm a dog. I don't deserve it. I come to the end of myself. I'm a dog. I don't deserve it. But I, even my little dogs get crumbs. You're definitely merciful. And, oh, my goodness, I could just imagine the light bulb that lit up Jesus' face when this lady, with these seemingly closed you know, statements, we're not an occasion to close and her to walk away. She just found another way to say, wait a minute, I can believe this about God. He's still a good God. She was not swayed from that. And because of who God is, and by now, by having all these quick answers, that she was giving, she built up in her the very first statement that she got from the beginning, and that is, oh, son of David, have mercy on me and deliver my daughter from demons. She built up that faith in her. See, when circumstances keep hounding you, guess what? That means you just got to get quick wit and start believing and keep remembering that God still said what he said and he does not change. He sent his word to perform it. He's going, he sent his word and he healed them. Okay? And you're not going to be moved by the, even, even in your conversation with God. You mean, I mean, we come up with great ideas about how God can do these things in our life. And, you know, you may have come up with some great ideas for God, you know, how he can deliver you. But you just keep the delivering power going in the inside and get tired of telling God how to do it and just start believing and keeping yourself built up and knowing that he will do and perform his word. All these things, these oppositions, they didn't detract her. They stirred her. They didn't cause her to relent and agree with the word and then come up with the conclusion that she can't get something. She can't get deliverance from, for her daughter. She was not having that. And see, that's what we've got to do because a lot of this stuff, we're so used to having it easy, we're so used to having it our way, 
We're so, I mean, and you know, some of us, we got some rich folk around here, and they can get whatever they want with the money they have. But you've got to come to the place where you're totally depend, dependent, totally on God. But that money, good, great, it ain't enough. I, my dependency has to be on God himself. You see, we have got to be glued to our Bibles, and we have got to believe the first principles of God and not be glued from the word of God. Make up your mind that it doesn't matter. Even if Jesus himself seems to throw up walls, all that is is a test that tests your resolve to believe his word. And believe it. It is a walk of faith, so that is going to be. When you sow seed, it doesn't pop up the next day. It takes time to water and grow. Right? So that's, that's faith. Faith is a mustard seed. It waters and grows. So how does it grow? That means that you, you stick with it. You leave the seed in the ground. It will produce fruit. But you got to leave it in the ground. If you don't endure to let that seed be watered and grown, it's, you're going to dig it up again. Is this seed working? Let me look at it. Let me get a microscope. Quit pulling your seed out of the ground. Let it germinate. Keep watering it. Keep sticking to it. And it will grow. You will see the end of your faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. You will see the end of it. And that is the result. The Word of God made promises. The Word of God has said truth. So you stick with it. Amen? Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. All she desired was that God be merciful with the one he sent, Yeshua HaMashiach, to save all mankind, the son of David, the ruler. Jesus is the ruler of Israel. And that... Um, all she is like determined is that, you know, he has power over these demons. My daughter has a demon. She needs to be delivered. Praise God, he's got to do it. He can do it. Because that's who he is. He's a good God. He's the one that has authority over the enemy. And so, in other words, God, who he is, became her great desire. But God, you're merciful. I know you're merciful. He, he, I know you're the one that has given authority over these demons to this man, Jesus. I know it. And he can do something about my daughter. You see, faith. It doesn't give up. Great faith endures and the face of what seems to be obvious circumstances, obvious shut doors, obvious closed boxes, obvious signs to turn back. Faith says no. God's word says, and that's who God is, based on who he is. I will receive what he said. I will receive what he said. Now, I'm not saying what you said. I'm saying what he said. <laughs> Amen. And he's going to test you. It's like, you know, him talking to the disciples. You feed them. What? what? We feed them. Same kind of thing going on here. Not sent to you. Okay. But you are merciful and you are the son of David and you are the one that has power over demons. Not in a covenant. Okay. You're the master. But even dogs get crumbs. You see how that goes? Every opportunity to be everything that came against her, or at least apparently it was coming against her, really wasn't coming against her. It was giving her occasion to really lock in her faith 
in the goodness of God. That's what it was doing. And so when you are faced with your circumstances, let it lock in the word of God. Let it just say, you know what? We're going to persevere here. We're going through it. Amen? Great faith knows that God's will and believes it to the very last. Great faith knows God's will and believes it to the very last. His will is his word. And they trust wholly in Jesus, who is the author the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Do you believe Jesus is the finisher of your faith? That's, that's great faith never gives up and holds on. Doesn't quit. Holds on. Hold on to the word of God. Don't let it go. Don't let that circumstance dictate your faith, dictate your faith, uh, dictate everything by your faith. You know God is good. You know his word says this. Just simply believe it. Just simply believe it. And, you know, be willing to change, too. You know, because God, you know, sometimes we might have to take measures in following what he tells us, you know, relationship. To do certain things, and that will lead to obedience, which, of course, is part of how you walk in faith. You obey the word of God. You understand the word that he speaks to you personally is the word of God. It won't contradict the Bible. If it doesn't contradict the Bible, we're good. Now, if it possibly contradicts the Bible, then maybe your word's not your word from God. Okay, It's maybe a word from the devil. You may be looking at circumstances in another way and not realize you're looking at a circumstance. You're looking at natural, not, not spirit, not what the Word says. A lot of times people look at the natural and think they're spiritual. You're not. You, if you want to be spirit, you just, the Word says this, that settles it. That's spirit. My words are spirit and life. So don't look into that. Oh, my goodness. I really went late today. Okay. Amen. Did you get something from the Lord in this morning? Amen. Are you going to hang in there? Stick to the Word of God? Or be, to you, be it to you as your faith. Be it to you as your faith. Oh, great is your faith. Amen. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Oh, man, great is your faith. And notice that the one, we have one example of a guy's request and one example of a girl's request. So God works for both guys and women. All right, men and women both. Amen. God hears you. Hallelujah. I'm wondering if that's why he did it that way. Why those read those two stories were recorded. But men and women have God's ear when they have faith. Hallelujah. When they choose faith over circumstances. When they choose faith over apparent roadblocks, hindrances. When they endure the test from God or even the test from the devil. They stay connected to the Bible. From the rock, Jesus is the rock. Do not move from him. You stay right there on him, with him. And your house will stand the storm. Amen? Let's pray. God, God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you that your word is speaking to us right now, today. And Lord, I thank you that we have the victory that your word says we have. You sent your word to perform. You sent your word and you healed. And I thank you, Lord, you sent in your word. And we have faith. We give you glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Good stand. Let's worship the Lord.